This video is brought to you by Skillshare. I have my own views of the word socialist. When, Hit when Hitler came to power, he was very interested in public health campaigns. Wait, I hope Democrats do run a democratic socialist. Do you hope that just, we win? Do you win uh, the Democrats? No, because I think you'll lose spectacularly, and then I will look forward to election night when I finally get to tell everybody I told you so. so. Yeah. I believe if Castro and the, and, the, and the Reds had won the Cold War, there would have been executions in Central Park, and I might have been one of the ones getting executed. When I started this video, I wanted to tell the story of the Holodomor, the devastating hunger plague that Ukraine experienced in 1932. I started my research, but quickly got sidetracked. All of a sudden, I was no longer just telling a story about a historical event, but smack in the middle of an argument about socialism. You see, there's a debate over whether or not the Holodomor should be considered a genocide and what side of the debate you stand on depends on your definition of genocide. The argument over what constitutes a genocide has a long and sordid history, but is contentious enough that, as far as the Holodomor is concerned, it seems to come down to how you feel about the USSR as a country. Extreme critics of the USSR use the story of the Holodomor to attack the whole concept of socialism. This gave me a lot to think about. I started work on this video almost two years ago, but finally I feel like I can't not talk about this. We're in this moment where, in the West anyway, socialism is back into the national consciousness in a big way. And for the first time in a long time, the narrative is more than just socialism is the bad thing that we need to forget about. I've been a socialist since I was 14, born from opposition to the Iraq war and Michael Moore documentaries. And until recently, it's been a lonely road. But now that socialism is back, it's time to have a conversation about what is, what it isn't, and how it is related to some of the darker moments of the history of the USSR. Socialism today is still playing from behind. Its ideas are mercilessly attacked, often with talk of the old Cold War villains like the scary Soviet Union. Then, when trying to show how socialism is more than that, we face from within the movement, tankies, authoritarian state socialists who make actual excuses for forced labor camps and mass executions. So at the risk of angering liberals, tankies, and conservatives alike, I'm going to talk about the narrative of the Cold War and Soviet-style communism shadow over the left. I'm going to look at the blackwashing of history and the battle over memory designed to stall a progressive left movement. And don't worry, I'll get to the Holodomor too. So let's just dive in. We'll begin at the end of history. In 1989, the Berlin Wall, through a series of miscommunications and overwhelming pressure, fell and with it broke down the border between East and West Germany. The fall of the Berlin Wall was the catalyst that started the great breakdown of the Eastern Communist Bloc. By Christmas of 1991, the Soviet Union, the grand experiment of the Marxist project, collapsed under years of inflexible bureaucracy and a growing divide between the center and the periphery of the vast state. The former bloc would face decades of political unrest, kleptomaniacal oligarchs, a stark decrease in standards of living, and the increasing creep of neoliberalism in from powerful Western economies. But in the West, this was a massive celebration. We won. Oh, groovy, smashing, yay capitalism. <laughs> the immortal foe in a decades-long conflict that threatened imminent destruction of the human race was gone. And it seemed to happen overnight. Shortly after the USSR collapsed, political scientist Francis Fukuyama published his most infamous work, the End of History and the Last Man. In the book, he claimed that with the collapse of Soviet-style communism, humanity had at last come into its final historical age. The perfect ideology of liberal democracy and neoliberal capitalism had taken hold. Humanity had reached not just the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such. That is, the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. This was, I'm going to say, instantly derided for the silly cheerleading it was. Some pointed out that liberal democracy and capitalism have serious flaws, which won't survive significant shocks to the system. Others made less good criticisms, such as Samuel Huntington, 
who said it wasn't racist enough. Okay, maybe a paraphrase there, but his theory, the clash of civilizations, is the basis for a lot of 21st century Islamophobia, so to be honest, screw him. With the collapse of the Soviet experiment, capitalism sure as hell acted triumphant. The United States emerged as a single world hegemonic superpower and self-appointed policeman of the whole world. Neoliberalism is an ideology which prioritizes market growth at the expense of everything else, including the environment and the humans within those economies. And now it was the dominant ideology of the globe. To learn more about what neoliberalism is and the effects it had on the world, you can check out this video I made. At the same time liberal democracy and neoliberal capitalism were taking over, the narrative of the Soviet Union and state socialism began to change. During the Cold War, the Soviets were an active living country, with lots of people interested in studying how it worked and what it did. Now it was history. The USSR stood as a symbol of an alternative to capitalism, for good and for ill, and people began to try and change that memory of the Soviet Union. Most infamous was the Black Book of Communism. You might not have heard about it, but I can guarantee you, you've heard its effects on the right-wing critique of socialism. If you take the body count, conservatively estimating about 100 million people. The Russian Revolution led to the death of at least 94 million people. The Black Book of Communism is a chronicling of the darkest chapters and totalitarian excesses of communist regimes in the 20th century. Most famous, though, is its introduction, written by the anthology editor Stéphane Coutois, who claimed 100 million people died because of communism. There is a slight problem with that figure, though. That book especially, I feel, is weaponized by the conservatives in this country. They always go back to this figure, 100 million deaths under 20th century state socialism, 100 million deaths of communism, the victims of communism. And yet, from the very beginning, that book had a huge amount of controversy because Stephen Courtois, who was the editor of this volume, you know, was obsessed with getting to that number. And even some of the people who contributed to that volume were distanced themselves from it the minute it was published. They were saying, these numbers are really weird. If you're interested in the gritty details, I'll leave a link to a great video by Vicky1999 breaking down the issues with the 100 million number. The story of the USSR and how it came to be in the old Russian Empire became a sad tale of the inevitable path from socialist ideals to totalitarian brutality. At the time I saw it as almost like a Pied Piper situation, where it's like you have people who are suffering a lot and they're desperate and they'll do anything to be to feel free. This new narrative led to a memory project, especially in Eastern Europe and especially, especially after the Great Recession of 2008, to build a tale of the victims of communism. According to this narrative, Communism, as an ideology, is just as, if not more, destructive than fascism. Even with the targeted genocides of the Holocaust, arguably the darkest chapter of humanity's entire history. And it didn't take long before this narrative, equating communism with fascism, had penetrated into the mainstream. Despite the lack of a socialist threat in Russia, anti-communism was high, arguably even higher in the post-Cold War years than before. And it's not like the critics of state socialism are entirely wrong. Several state socialist regimes, the USSR chief among them, committed horrible atrocities. There is a troubling trend in leftist spaces outside of academia to facilitate between silence on these atrocities, or even worse, make excuses for them, sometimes to the point of what I'd call genocide denial. Under the reign of Joseph Stalin, the USSR ran a network of brutal forced labor camps in inhospitable territory called gulags. From 1929 to 1953, as many as 14 million people found themselves in these camps as political prisoners, POWs, those who made jokes about the government, or were just regular criminals but were found guilty without a trial. It is estimated that at least a million souls died in the gulags. Conditions in these camps were nowhere close to what narratives say about them, but they weren't great, and they still were forced labor camps in the middle of nowhere. In Ukraine, botched collectivization and industrialization projects exacerbated drought and crop disease to create a massive famine known as the Holodomor. The implementation of food requisitioning, combined with a decrease in yields, 
led to a severe food shortage. The government then cracked down on other ways of getting food, leading to mass starvation. Then, the government also blocked people in famished areas from going to more plentiful ones, causing even more death. Whether this was grotesque, sociopathic mismanagement, or an intentional program to use famine to squash Ukrainian nationalism, is still up for scholarly debate. Still, it is one of the Soviet Union's darker chapters. In a similar vein, when state socialist China underwent industrialization on a quick scale, known as the Great Leap Forward, environmental devastation based on terrible agricultural innovations led to, even by conservative estimates, the worst famine in human history in absolute numbers. And for an ideology purportedly opposed to empires and fascists, the USSR did have an empire of its own and made an alliance with fascists. At the beginning of the Second World War, the USSR invaded Finland in an attempt to take territory off them. They also conquered and annexed the states of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. After the war, the USSR made several Eastern Bloc states into satellites, often interfering in their politics, if not downright ordering them around. Then there was the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, in which the USSR and Nazi Germany made a non-aggression pact which precipitated a double invasion of Poland, a country which became one of those satellites after the war. I feel most people, especially leftists, I'd argue would find these actions utterly abhorrent, regardless of why they did it. Except maybe the 17-year-olds in my comment section with Stalin profile pictures. I think this is an important point to make. These acts were terrible. Not talking about them gives free ammunition to the right, and denial and apologetics makes us look like monsters. Even quibbling over absolute numbers while necessary for historical accuracy, which I'm all for, is not enough to save the case. These were terrible acts. No matter how many or how few died, or how many more capitalism is killed, or whatever. Also, there's a compelling argument that if you look at how the USSR actually functioned, it might have been socialist in name only. The USSR could be argued to function more like a massive corporation rather than what Karl Marx wrote about. The whole idea of totalitarianism, of comparing Stalinist Russia to Nazi Germany, and the horror at the Gulag and the labor camps, I absolutely agree with those things. They have very, very little to do with the aims of socialism or communism. The only way to understand it is to see the process whereby you moved from a genuine socialist revolution in Russia in 1917, where workers were taking control of factories, setting up democratic institutions to run society, and how all that, of that was lost. And in the end, the workers in Russia were the most oppressed, the most downtrodden, with the least power. They couldn't go on strike. You know, if they stepped out of line, they could end up in the, in the gulag. So the idea that that equals 1917 or socialism is, is ridiculous. I mean, the, the way I would describe it is that people like Stalin or Mao were state capitalists. They were running society. It's nationalized. Everything is controlled by the state, but the state is a corporation. And even the one thing many people give credit to the horrible dictator Joseph Stalin for, the winning of World War II, breaks down under scrutiny. Russia had a pretty powerful and well-organized army at the outbreak of the Great Patriotic War, as they describe it, in 1941. When Operation Barbarossa takes place, Hitler's invasion of Russia, the biggest land invasion in world history, Stalin was still hoping to preserve peace with Germany. He wasn't ready to the begin the war. And he got apparently something like 85 different reports of the German army are crossing the border, German planes are flying into our airspace, we need to mobilize to defend ourselves. And Stalin said, no, 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 if we mobilize, that will be an excuse for Hitler to attack. Now, <laughs> Hitler was attacking. Uh, Stalin denied all the reports, and what it meant was that something like three and a half million Russian troops were just caught without any warning by this massive uh, lots of the Russian aircraft, which had been built up carefully over the years, were just destroyed on the ground. Complete mayhem, all due to Stalin's refusal to accept what Hitler was doing. And Stalin disappears from the scene for two weeks. Nobody saw him or anything. He, there's a suspicion that he had a nervous breakdown. But certainly he disappears, and the only voice you hear on the radio is Molotov his foreign minister. The idea that Stalin won the war 
I think is completely false. Stalin almost lost the war. What happened afterwards, though, was that the Germans were so brutal in their treatment of the Russian people, and it was the Russian people who decided, we're not going to stand for this, we are going to fight back, we're going to resist. And I, I really see it as, rather than Stalin being the hero, that it was the Russian people. We can't remove these actions from their historical context. The first lesson you learn in history methods class is statements such as, history repeats itself, are overly simplistic, and often wrong. A good historian can learn from the past, but shouldn't use it to predict the future. To do so requires abstracting or ignoring important clues and contexts. That is, if we don't misremember the history altogether. It is not a good idea to pretend that none of these bad things happen. But what is a good idea is to put those things in the context of the time, right? To, to understand the larger history, to understand the nuance and complexity of the 20th century, and not to reduce it to a simple black and white, good and evil. And I think that that's really, in this day and age, I feel like it's really hard for people to do. Let's have a look at 1917. The revolution happened in the midst of a world war. What did the Russians do on the first day? There were two million Russians had died, by the way, in the war. What did the Bolshevik government do on the first day? They stopped the war. The peasants had been wanting the land for hundreds of years. What did they do on the first day? They gave the peasants the land. So the idea that the revolution is violent Actually, the revolution stopped violence. It stopped Russian involvement in the war and therefore saved huge numbers of lives. It inspired the Germans, and the Germans made a revolution. And you know what happened there. On the 9th of November, the German population overthrew the Kaiser. On the 11th of November, the First World War stopped. Leftists today, especially in Western countries, are not living under brutal monarchies embroiled in the worst war up to that point in history. There's not an authoritarian leftist international community you need to please to get resources. The Cold War is over. Let's go back to the Black Book of Communism for a minute. Making equivalencies between the Soviet project and Nazi Germany's targeted effort to eradicate Jews, Roma people, Jehovah's Witnesses, LGBTQ plus people, and disabled people is disgusting. Intentionally or not, this tries to make an ideology, which for all its flaws is rooted in an idea of human equality, equivalent to an ethno-nationalist movement intent on genocide. Or at the most insidious, this is an attempt to blunt the gravity of the crimes of the Nazis. We see the effects of this in the victims of communism narrative in Eastern Europe after 2008. In Eastern Europe, it's much more nefarious because the victims of communism narrative is used to exonerate actual fascists. And when I say actual fascists, I am not, not using that term euphemistically. I'm, I'm using that term to name people like Petr Gabrovsky, for instance, the Bulgarian Minister of Interior, who literally signed the deportation orders for the Greek and Macedonian Jews during World War II. And to further use the words of Dr. Godsey, in regards to the Soviet and state socialist projects, there was a baby in that bathwater we threw out in 1991. The USSR had a successful public health care system, free education available to men and women, good and frankly beautiful public transit, and a network of state-funded daycare and preschools. These systems gave women a level of economic independence not experienced outside the USSR until much later. In fact, few capitalist countries, if any, meet that level today. In Dr. Godsey's book, Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism, she shows this independence allowed women to choose what relationships they wanted to enter. She makes the case that until we can, like the Soviets, remove the market from the caring economy, we won't ever have a real shot at gender equality. We are fully capable of learning from what worked under these regimes while not subtracting from the horrible mistakes made and the atrocities committed. To make the claim that socialism is just gulags and famines is to say liberalism is just colonization and slavery. And I'll editorialize here and say that the horrible mistakes of industrialization are less about them being communist than totalitarian while at the same time, slavery and colonization were directly about capitalist profits. And for the Americans, I want to let you in on another secret. Socialism 
wasn't just the USSR. There's an incredible amount of diversity in the bloc. And, um, and, then, and then we're not even talking about places like Cuba and China, right? Or African countries like, um, you know, or, or like uh, uh, Zambia, for instance, which are socialists but non aligned, or Tanzania, or if we look at Angola, or if we look at Yemen, right? There, there are all sorts of di um, diverse places where socialism in one form or another was taking root. Chile under Allende, or Nicaragua under the Sandinistas. So, complicated, nuanced history of communism in different places by different people in different ways, even within the Soviet Union, right? You have different saws, you know, post uh, de Stalinization allowed for a lot of flourishing. We know that books were published that wouldn't have been published in the 30s. We have Perestroika and Glasnost under Gorbachev in the 80s. The whole, we have this very radical moment in the 20s. And so we know that even the history of the Soviet Union is way more complicated. In books like the Gulag Archipelago, everything gets reduced down to Stalinism. Most countries, save the US, learn about why in this video, have some form of labor party whose ideology ranges from social democracy, people who want to pepper capitalism with socialist policies, to democratic socialists who want to use peaceful political means to transition out of capitalism to something better. Scandinavian countries have thrived with strong socialist policies. You can argue that in the latter half of the 20th century, the UK didn't grow as well economically as countries like France and Germany because they abandoned many socialist projects in their economy. Socialism is a big, big world with lots of different ideas for how to make this world a better place and is way more than the USSR. Francis Fukuyama has in recent years taken back his statements from 1992 about socialism. Now he's gone on the record to say socialism should make a comeback. And he's not alone. I have been some form of a socialist since 2003, but I have to say it is becoming a lot less lonely since Occupy Wall Street and the Bernie Sanders race of 2016. And with that growth, or in the US a return to actual left-wing politics, there has been a nasty pushback. The happiest person right now is about 1.15 Moscow time. America will never be a socialist country. Too many young Americans don't know anything about capitalism. They don't know why it's good. They think socialism is good. The right have used this red baiting as a cudgel to bash even moderate social democratic reforms, such as public health care. The years of what Dr. Godsey calls blackwashing of history of the USSR has become a nasty front in a war of memory used to stall progressive politics. The fight over how we remember the past is really important. It's the reason I created Step Back. And right now, we have seeded a lot of this memory to the right, sometimes even the far right, without challenge. Hey everyone, not sure if you guys know this, but I'm a full-time YouTuber, which means that to pay rent and keep my cats- That's not good. Okay. Fed, I would like to take a moment to talk about this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online community for creatives where millions come together to take the next step of their creative journey. Skillshare offers thousands of courses and inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and more. Many Step Back viewers are lifelong learners and I really recommend Skillshare for picking up new knowledge. One course I devoured for this video was Powerful Storytelling Today, Strategies for Crafting Great Content, taught by CNN journalist Soledad O'Brien. She really doesn't like Bernie or this leftist movement if her Twitter is to believe, so this is a little warm feeling to know that her wonderful lessons made this video possible. If you want to pick up some valuable skills for the dystopian gig economy, the link in the description will give you two free months of the premium service. A little dosh in your pocket, for putting some in mine. Thank you Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now this socialist backlash can be enough to make you feel discouraged, gaslit, and sometimes even hopeless. I know I've had my moments. Capitalism has made a lot of broken, angry people. And some of those broken, angry people end up in activist circles bringing with them toxic, violent ideation. It doesn't mean that you just roll over if someone's going to come and kill you and kill your family and your friends and your comrades, you know what I mean? Like, that's not what we're talking about. But people always need to throw that in there just to kind of justify them indulging in these, like, really violent ideation and bravado about capital R revolution and, like, ushering in this new great thing for everybody. This kind of revolution, trying to LARP 
a mythical 1917 is unfeasible and toxic. What's driving you is not to heal and love and hold space for people and help people. Like you're coming from a place of, I want to harm. I feel sh and I feel harmed and I want to harm the people who did this, right? If you get rid of those people, they will just be replaced with new ones. <laughs> you know what I mean? You'll be harming and harming and harming and it won't go away. Like this is a systemic issue. This drive to do harm is actually really toxic, right? And you need to actually uncover what it, what's going on inside you will be satisfying to you, right? Because like that's completely against like a human's empathetic response for other people, even if they're bad people and they've done bad things like to sit there and get off on pain and suffering that isn't actually going to transform anything. Like it's not gonna take away the crimes that happen. It's not gonna heal anybody. It's not going to necessarily make a better world, right? And how are we gonna actualize a, a society with the values and the practice of restorative justice if this is where we're coming from? Socialism and leftism in general is a big diverse movement that's often plagued by internal divisions, which get us nowhere. I guess one of the big things I'm trying to do is promote the idea that tactical unity is possible. Um, it might be far down the road and full leftist unity might not be achievable, at least in the near future. But I think we can find common ground to work together and try to see if we can resolve some of the differences we have. And without any grasp on the dials of power, we are already facing a lot of difficulties making positive change in the world. We need to move away from the rhetoric of what we can't do. Many who are resisting this new movement are either afraid of change or afraid of challenges to their privilege. We can't forget the dark chapters of the past, but we can learn from them. Don't let them gaslight you. Don't let them scare you. This word that I know it gets used a lot on the left, utopianism, right? That there's a sort of utopian horizon that we need in order to kind of lift ourselves out of the political and economic circumstances within which we are so deeply embedded. So if it, if it helps, you know, to dream, then, then we should dream. I think we need to dream. And part of liberating those dreams is, you know, lessening some of the memory politics war that's going on. And without a dream, a vision for what the world we want to make is, we'd be truly lost. Socialism is a movement born of the idea of the fundamental equality of all people. It struggled for centuries before I was born and will continue to long after I'm gone. We're all in this world together. And while we fight, let's look out for each other because we can, no, we must make things better. Be sure to check out my videos on neoliberalism and the US left if you wanna go more in depth on this. I also stream on Twitch Mondays and Tuesdays at twitch.tv slash history. Thank you to Skillshare for their sponsorship. I'd also like to give a special thank you to my patrons. This video took a huge amount of work and I couldn't have done it without you. If you wanna join the amazing people on this list, go to patreon.com slash history, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you guys again soon.